verses in Mark chapter 3, and if you would turn to it and stand when you get it in your Bible, we will look at it together. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Father, today we come before you. We're grateful for your presence with us this morning. We're grateful to be able to celebrate the good things that you have done. We genuinely confess to you, Lord, that we continue to need your care in revealing yourself to us and your leadership in our lives. I pray that you would speak, Lord, to every heart here today, that each one of us would go away encouraged, Jesus, by who you are and who we are and can be in you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in terms of introducing these verses today and just want to talk a little bit about where we are in Mark's gospel as we've been preaching through from Mark chapter 1, verse 1, to the point that we're at today, which is the end of chapter 3. At this point in Mark's gospel, what we've seen is we've seen the popularity of Jesus continue to grow. And right now, we're right in a time where everywhere he goes, the crowds are increasing. He has to have the disciples get a boat for him while he's preaching by the seaside because the crowd's so great, he's getting ready to be pushed into the water. There is so much ministry going on in these first three chapters of Mark's Gospel. So much statement of Jesus' powerful teaching. If you remember early on, the first time he preached in the synagogue, the response of the people was, we've never heard preaching like this. He preaches with power. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees preach. He preaches with power. And then at that same service, what did he do? He delivered a person who had an unclean spirit or a demon tormenting him. So we see this incredible increase of ministry of Jesus' teaching and deliverances and healing ministries. And so Jesus is, I hate to say it this way, but Jesus has brought a change and a fresh spiritual wind that is blowing in this culture all around wherever he is. In our, in our vernacular, we might say, Jesus is the flavor of the day. I don't like to say it that way because usually in our culture, the flavor of the day comes and the flavor of the day ascends and the flavor of the day disappears. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But you cannot miss, if you have been reading this, that as wonderful as what Jesus is doing is, as fresh as it is, as full of life as it is, almost immediately as he starts, conflict also starts. 
and conflict begins to break out. I don't know if you've ever worried about that or been concerned about that, but it's one of the things that I want us to look at today because it's what the verses I wrote to you, I read to you are all about. I want to turn the page back to what Pastor Jeff preached on last week, though I will not review what he did. I just want to point out to you a couple of verses in chapter 3. Listen to it, because this is where we read the end of the story, but where it starts is in Mark chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. I want you to get the picture. He goes into a house, he begins to teach, he begins to share the Word of God with power and with an understanding and a clarity that they've never heard, and the house just continues to get packed to the point where apparently some time has passed. He and the disciples were so involved in the ministry, they could not even stop and eat. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened in America, you would say, something awesome must have been going on because we always stop and eat. (laughs) And I don't think the Jewish people were any different than that. Got to stop and eat, whatever's happening. Listen to verse 21. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Remember I talked to you about conflict. Well, here is something that we weren't looking for. His mother and his brothers are in conflict with what Jesus is doing. I don't know about you, but that, I find that very surprising. Now, they're not the only ones. Because the next verses say, there are also teachers who came down from Jerusalem, teachers of the law, and they were ready to put in their two cents about Jesus. Mom and the boys are saying, you know, in in the original translation, what it really says, it says, his mother and his brothers came and they were ready to take him by force because they thought he was out of his mind. In other words, they're going to come. Aren't families great? Don't you love families? And I'll bet we've all loved it when a group of family members decided we were headed in the wrong way, and they decided we're going to have a little intervention with Pastor Peter. He's gone too far this time. That's the scene. That's the scene I want you to see. Okay? And... At the same time, you have these teachers coming down and saying, they don't deny that Jesus is doing powerful things. They don't deny his spectacular rise in popularity. But here's what they say. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus is doing miracles, but it's not God. It's the devil in him. And, of course, that was the topic of Pastor Jeff's sermon last time, the unforgivable sin. This idea that when God reveals himself to us and we choose to call that the devil, we're opposing God. And if you continue to oppose God, you're in big trouble. So, This idea of conflict, and here's what I want you to see as we take apart these few verses. Here's what I want you to get. If you walk away with nothing else but this today, here's the deal. Every individual, his mother, his brothers, the Jewish teachers, the people from his town, his neighbors, you and I, every one of us need to determine who is he. Who is Jesus 
to you. Who is Jesus to his mom and to his brothers? Who is Jesus to the Jewish people, to the teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees and the neighbors? Who is Jesus? So now we'll get to the we'll get to the passage that I've been charged to share with you. Jesus is doing what God has called him to do. How many of you are glad that Jesus came and did what God called him to do? How many of you are glad that when he taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray like this, pray to your Father in heaven, our Father who is in heaven, blessed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You remember when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane when his popularity, he was no longer popular because now at the end of the story, if you didn't know who Jesus was, you weren't going to follow him because the cost was too high. So at the end of the story, he has only his disciples and he only has 11 of them at that point because Judas has already gone to sell him out and he's praying in the garden. And what does he say? What does he say? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Was Jesus just a good man? Was Jesus a prophet? Who was Jesus? Do you remember when Jesus approached his own disciples, when many were leaving him, when it was the post time, there weren't thousands being fed anymore that he was speaking to, okay? But the numbers were dropping off. And because of the things that he was saying, they couldn't grasp it. And so people began to leave him. And he said, to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist resurrected. Some the prophet. Some this, some that. I can imagine this scene. He looks his disciples in the eye face to face and he gets to the point that is my point today. Who do you say that I am. Thanks be to God for Peter's answer. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says something. He's blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood is not in, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Here they are. Here comes mom and the brothers. They think they're doing a good thing. They think they're doing the right thing. They don't particularly see that they're opposing Jesus. They think they're helping Jesus. After all, he needs our help. We, we should go help your brother. He's a good man, good heart, but wow, what has happened to him? He's gone a little off the rails. Aren't you glad that the Bible is written so incredibly wonderfully that we can see the human spirit and motivation that is in every one of us? Put your hand up if you see that same kind of motivation in yourself. This is the hope of the gospel, that the God who knows us came and spoke to us in such a way that it is impossible for us not to see that he knows who we are from start to finish and everything in between. I'm so grateful for that. I've never surprised him yet. How about you? The psalmist says, before 
there is a word on my tongue, you know it. You know my thoughts from far away. What a mighty God we serve. I'm also very glad for God's patience, which you see in this passage. So, mom and the brothers come, and word comes to Jesus inside the house. And the word to Jesus inside the house is, hey, your mother and your brothers are calling for you. Listen to Jesus' response. Who are my mother and my brothers? Wow. What did the people in that room think at that point in time? What were they thinking? But he's posing them a question. And the question to me goes like this. Who knows me the very best? How many of you ever grew up, don't raise your hand because you might have family here. How many of you ever grew up, and as you grew up, you understood that your mom and your dad and your siblings saw you a certain way, and you understood that what they didn't see are the changes that took place in you, the different person that you were from the time that you used to live with them? Don't raise your hand. Okay. It is the absolute most common experience that every person who gets to the age of 30 or 35 or 40 absolutely has. Thanks be to God to those parents who are able to embrace and accept change in the children that they thought they knew so well. So listen to the question. Who are my mother and my brothers? Who really are the people that know me intimately? Who are the people that I should have the greatest loyalty to and bond to? Who are those people? Who are the people that have the greatest genuine intimacy with me? That's how I hear the question. Who are the people that enjoy my full and genuine trust. And then Mark, in the way that Mark writes so beautifully, he gives us a picture. I hope you can see the picture. Here's the picture. Then, now notice, he doesn't answer his mother and his brothers one bit. This is something we could all learn. Pastor Jeff mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Sometimes when conflict comes against us, you do not need to try to defeat the conflict. What you need to do is continue to do the thing you know is right. So here is Jesus. He doesn't answer mom and the brothers. He just looks. I want you to get this picture. He's sitting, and he is surrounded by people. And unlike our culture where we we need elbow room and hip room, it wasn't like that in the East, okay? He's crowded by people all around him. The house is packed to the roof, to the rafters. It's packed. So he stops, and he looks around, at the people that are all around him. And Mark makes a point of this. He looks at them, and as he's looking at them, here is what he says. Here are my mother and my brothers. Here we are. I hope today you can hear God say that to you. Who deserves the trust of Jesus? Who knows Jesus? Who knows him intimately? Here. 
are my mother and my brothers. He goes on. He gives them an invitation. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. I don't know about you. That makes me want to do God's will. Because Jesus is inviting them to be more to him than a worldly mother or a worldly blood relative. Jesus is saying to these people that are listening to them, I want to invite you to really know me, to be the recipient of revelation, to be the recipient of who I truly am going to show you that I am. And here's the cost. In the same way that I was sent to do the will of my Father in heaven, so if you want to be a part of that spiritual family, you need to make a decision that I am who the Father sent and that you choose to follow me by doing the will to the best of your ability in the same way that I have come to do the will of my Father in heaven. Just close your eyes for a minute. Imagine that you were alive during Jesus' time and imagine that you are in that room and there's excitement in that room and suddenly you realize that mom and the other elder brothers are coming and they come right to the house where you're sitting with Jesus, enjoying Jesus. And while you're there in awe of what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is doing, you understand that all of a sudden, here is this conflict with mom and the brothers. And you expect Jesus to solve it because after all, he's very powerful. But he doesn't solve it whatsoever. He turns to you in that room and looks you in the eye and says to you, I want to tell you that if you keep doing my will, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are my mother. What could be better? You can open your eyes. I, I don't know about you, but I, I can tell you about myself. In this spiritual journey, I'm, I'm going to confess now, okay? I won't ask you for anything. In this spiritual journey, I find that I sometimes slip. And in my worst times, I sometimes even slide. I'm not talking about backsliding, but I'm talking more about the idea of I slide without even knowing it off of and away from the focus. I may even be doing good hard work and things that people think are wonderful and need to be done, and I may even be getting attaboys from uh, my family and from Christian people, but here's what I've noticed. What I've noticed is this one thing Jesus is talking about, doing the will of God, I've noticed that without my focus being on what Jesus just said to me, I, I need him to say this to me every day. I need him to keep me focused. Otherwise, I just kind of slide into things that Forgive me for a minute. They're just not as important as being close to Jesus. They're just not. And I know there's important things. How many of you, don't raise your hands. How many of you have important things in your life? So many you can't get them done every day. And you're looking for a time when one day you do get them all done every day. Never going to happen. 
Never going to happen. Because all the things that are important to us in our day must take second place to our relationship with Him. Otherwise, what is it for? I was talking to, uh, talking to Pastor Jeff last week, and we had a nice conversation over, over breakfast, and we were just talking about things as we normally do, and I reflected to him how, you know, in the last year, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you know, I, I'm sure you do, but, you know, in the course of the last year, last calendar year, really more like 13 months, we climbed a mountain. How many of you know we climbed a mountain? Okay. Travis has both hands up because he and, he and all of your council members and, and staff know we climbed a mountain. And I was saying, you know, we have to realize that when you climb a mountain, I don't know if there's any climbers or hikers, but if you climb high, the higher places, you've got to prepare for it, and you've got to go after it, and you've got to climb it, and you've got to persevere or you never get to the top. But when you finally get to the top and you've gotten there, do you know what you do when you get to the top? You rest. You enjoy the moment. When we succeeded with the Saving Grace campaign, I don't know if I was the only one in the council that thought this way. When we got the pledges, and then when we signed the bank contract, I remember going, thank you, God, I'm turning off my brain about this subject for the next month. Okay, now, here's what I'm trying to say to you. That's not sin that's the normalcy of a human being who has put out a tremendous amount of effort, who has run the race, who has fought the battle, and who has gotten to the point where you see God brought you victory. Thanks be to God. But here's what I've noticed about the church. After God gives you victory, there's a very large opportunity for you to coast. I'm asking that you don't coast. God is blessing, and He's blessing us, and He's adding people to us, and there's a lot to be done. Please do not coast. I understand it. I get it. If you need to take a break, Take a break and get girded up in strength to keep going. Folks, we are not done. In fact, it's the opposite of that. God has opened the doors of opportunity for something tremendous to happen that brings glory to his name. I don't know how I got there. There's none of that in my notes. And I'm sure I'm going to hear from Pastor Jeff. You're telling people about our conversations that we have and when we have breakfast together? No, not really. Just painting a picture. So, here's Jesus and he's given us a choice. Aren't you glad that Jesus gives you a choice? He gives us a choice. He's there with the people around him giving them a choice. By the way, when he's giving them a choice, he's giving his mom and his brothers the same choice, and thanks be to God, they came up to it. Thanks be to God that Jesus' brother James was one of the writers of a New Testament book and reputed to be, reputed to be the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Thanks be to God that his brother Jude also wrote a New Testament powerful letter, short but very powerful. Thanks be to God that we see Mary taking care of her dead son, numbering among a few women who, if you read carefully, looks like they were the only ones who believed that he was what he was 
But how could he be? Because he died, and we saw him die. Are you okay? The choice. The invitation. The invitation comes, I want you to have intimacy with me, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want you to have that intimacy with me, to be like a brother that I grew up with, to be like a sister in my household, to be like the mother of the family. I invite you into that kind of a relationship with me. And here's how you get there. Continue to choose to do the will of God. If you're here today and you understand that you cannot do everything, raise your hand. I could go further. If you're here and you understand that you can't even do half the things that face you, raise your hand. That actually got a better response. But Jesus never asks us to do things that we cannot do. He is saying to these people, if you want to be intimate with me, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do my Father's will. I want you to follow in my footsteps, learning who I am, learning who the Father is, and as you learn who God is, you will learn how to do His will. Thanks be to God we have His Spirit to help us in all of those things. But again, each and every one of us must decide who Jesus is. And you know, some of the best decisions that we make in terms of faith, this is not a one-time decision. And the American church has a love affair with the idea that at one point in time, I said yes to Christ. I said, yes, I do his will. I said, yes, I believed in him, and that's it. And that's not what I have found. I have found that to persist with Christ, I need to continue to say yes to Christ. Okay, I turned 70 last week. So, <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, it's just a number. Some of, you, some of you are looking at me saying, I wish I was only 70. Some of you are looking and saying, I didn't know he was that old. <laughs> yeah, I have a very young wife. <laughs> Younger by what, three months? <laughs> <laughs> That's why you should listen to me, you're younger. Digging myself a hole. <laughs> Digging myself a hole. There, there, there are some amazing things in the Bible. I want to remind you of them because the invitation, how many of you know that the invitation comes with a cost? All right? You've got to answer the invitation. Right? If you don't send back the wedding inv invitation and say, yes, I'm coming, I plan on me for the dinner, guess what's going to happen? There won't be dinner for you. Right? But here, here is something that, just a beautiful verse. It's in John 6, verse 29. You'll, you'll be aware of it. They say to Jesus... Well, what is the work that God wants us to do? And he says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. Now, forgive me for a minute, but you, you understand enough about Christianity to understand that when the Bible says believe, that word believe or the idea of faith that is always an active tense, it doesn't work to say, for me, I believed in Jesus 50 plus years ago in the early days of May on a college campus that I went to. Do you believe? Yeah, I believed. See, that's past tense. 
okay? The work of God is that we believe, we have believed, we are believing, and we're going to continue to believe in the one whom God sent, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of God, the one who has the name above every name, the one who one day every human being will see Jesus Christ glorified and above all of the earth. Belief has less to do with doctrine than we would like it to. Belief has got to do with the person that God sent for reconciliation. Belief has got to do with a persistence of that faith that at the lowest time and the worst time and the greatest failure and the most pain, you do not change your mind about who the Son of God is and what He came to do because when you believe like that, you will be convinced He will do it, not in you, but in me. He's going to do it to all those who persevere in faith regardless of circumstances, happening, pain, difficulty, rejection, and conflict. A friend of mine called me up. He said, what do you think about these, the way that James introduces his letter? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials and temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Wow. When we go through things in this life, it is not designed to quench our belief. It is, def it is designed to refine our belief. I need to finish this. I want to talk to you a little bit about conflict because that's the context. On the earth, there's always conflict. Do you remember what Jesus said? I did not come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. You see, Jesus, the Word of God, has a two-edged sword, and the picture of it in the Bible is it's coming out of his mouth. And here's the problem. We don't like conflict. Anybody here like conflict? We better get a hold of you. I think you're out of your mind. No. Okay? No one likes conflict. We don't like conflict. We want peace. But here's what I'm going to tell you. When God begins a new spiritual work in you and in me and in a group of people, it has to cause conflict because God wants people on this earth to see the difference between their will being done and God's will being done. It will ever be that way. We should be more worried when there's no conflict that ever comes against us because of our stand for Jesus Christ. If the world can just choose to leave us alone because we do not matter, we are failing in our mission to be testament and testimony of Christ. You'd be surprised to know how little of this is planned. Or maybe you wouldn't be. The work of God. Why is there conflict? There's conflict because our brother Peter says, Behold, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now you, to you who believe this, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Are you listening? Most of that is Isaiah's prophecy. And Isaiah's prophecy says this, Jesus is the cornerstone upon which the people of faith who believe in him build a life that cannot be destroyed by the storms of this earth. That's who he is. 
But to those who do not believe, Jesus becomes a rock of offense, a rock of stumbling. Why is he a rock of offense? Why is he a rock of stumbling? Why were the Pharisees offended? Why were the scribes offended? Why were some of the Jewish people offended? Because Jesus did not talk in gray terms. Jesus talked in clear, bright, light, white. Jesus talked in ways that left you with no gray area to hide in. And if you look at the gospel, it is that way through and through and through. Again, I want to mention a few things as the, as the worship team come back, comes back, and then we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to respond personally sometime. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. There's no gray in that statement. No gray. He who is not with me is against me. Listen to this one. He who does not gather with me scatters. No gray in that statement. Matthew chapter 13 talks about the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. And a man found it and went and hid it again, sold all that he had to buy that treasure. Do do you hear how absolutely, here's the problem. Here's our problem today. There is only one name given under heaven by which men may be saved. There's the conflict. There's the stumbling stone right there. You're a Christian and you're insisting to me that God loves you and yet you're telling me at the same time that if I do not believe in Jesus Christ, there is no way for me to be saved. There is no way for me to go forward spiritually. Yes, that's not what I'm telling you. That's actually what the Bible says. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Would you rather have nice or would you rather have truth? John wrote a beautiful thing. He said, He was the true light that came into the world, and His light illuminated men. Do you know when God illuminated me, and when I saw the depth of my sin, I had a choice. Reject the light or bow down to the one who is the light. Thanks be to God, somehow, it wasn't immediate, somehow in the hours that followed, I found the help from God to turn my back on the world and on what people would say and to make a decision and say, Jesus. You've shown me you are the Messiah. You are the real and genuine God. Would you stand with me? I want to ask you, before you go away, if you just stand and present yourself to the Lord. We're going to hear our worship team lead us in a final song, but... I actually want to ask you to consider the invitation that Jesus gave to that group of people. And uh, I don't want any of us to decide, I've already, I've already answered that. I'm asking you today, do you want to go deeper in terms of the revelation of Jesus Christ to your life, who he is, where he wants you to go forward? Are you ready this morning to having climbed the mountain and having taken a little break, are you ready this morning to say, I need to be strengthened to go higher, to go deeper with my God? Close your eyes with me. Father, we're here before you and I just keep seeing the picture of you being with that group of people in the house, that packed house. And we're, Lord, just like that. We're here because we do have interest in you. Some of us are fully committed to you. Some of us, Lord, maybe just at a starting point, 
Some of us need you to show us more who you are. All these things we lift to you in prayer. But Father, I want to say to you, I need you, Lord, to go forward. I need your help, Lord, to go deeper, to not slip, to not slide, to not move off the path. Perhaps some this morning need to say, Lord Jesus, I've been, I've been fighting this, but it's time for me to see that you and you alone are the Son of God, the Savior of my life. For all these things, Lord, we trust you. In Jesus' name.